Again, dear friends, it is an honor to have been invited to speak about the work of my foundation for the well-being of society at the start of this important conference on child and adolescent well-being. The President's Foundation for the Well-Being of Society was brought into being on the 23rd June 2014. Through the activities of my foundation, we have in a short time met with thousands of people. We have entered into sustained and deepening consultations with communities and groups across the Maltese Islands and beyond. The Foundation's ethos is rooted in our dedication to nurturing well-being through processes of inclusion and participation. All our efforts to explore and cultivate well-being in society are measured against this ambitious benchmark. Our drive towards innovation alongside our commitment to receiving and acting upon feedback has meant that the Foundation's methods and project portfolio are in a constant state of creative development. The willingness to grow and to improve our initiatives was at the heart of our second year anniversary celebrations held a few weeks ago. Various participants from across civil society were asked to reflect on the Foundation's methodology and share their vision for the future of our work. A recurring message throughout our anniversary consultation was the beneficial quality of the encounters that participants experience in the safe and respectful spaces created by the Foundation. Indeed, our ethos of well-being is the constant message we bring to all the individuals, the organizations, and the communities we meet. Our message is simple but profound. The voice of each and every member of society is valid. It is vital and it has a dynamic role to play in strengthening the well-being of all humanity. It is by celebrating the particularities of our identities seen through the lens of age, of gender, of sexual orientation, of ethnicity, of socioeconomic status, of faith tradition and culture, that we will be able to continue our work. It is by honoring our differences while exploring areas of mutual concern that we are connecting with people across society. With these aim aims in mind, the Foundation has facil facilitated with the creation of two NGO platforms that unite different groups to work together for common goals. One of these platforms has created a respectful space for NGOs working in the area of mental health. The other brings together NGOs led by, by asylum seekers and refugee groups. Through the work of the refugee NGOs-led platform, vulnerable communities have met with representatives from Malta's trade unions and the Maltese media. Important conversations have taken place which seek to change the way asylum seekers and refugees are perceived, the kind of treatment they receive, and the ways they are empowered to access their rights. Our work has, taken, has also taken us on many occasions beyond the shores of my country. Through the President's Foundation, an international institute for peace and well-being has been formed with the aim of promoting its core values throughout the Mediterranean and beyond. It is thanks to this institute and our collaborators from MEDIC at the University of Malta, George Mason University in the United States, the University of Cambridge and the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom, UNESCO, ISESCO and others that we shall continue to share our message in ever far-reaching ways. Our work has seen us enter into agreements with a variety of groups and organizations. 
working with one of Malta's institutes for higher learning and through the Institute for Peace and Wellbeing. We are currently engaged in a project entitled Sanctuary. The project shall transform portions of San Anton Presidential Palace into areas of conservation and cultivation for the promotion of environmental heritage and to sustain vulnerable communities. The Sanctuary Project is being carried out in collaboration with several embassies. And here I must mention Her Excellency Jane Lambert, Australian High Commissioner to Malta and an, and an alumna of this university. Her constant support for my foundation's initiatives has been a clear reflection of the excellent friendship and the shared ideals that exist between our nations. Let me now describe in a little more detail the structure of my foundation. The two pillars on which the foundation stands are its consultative fora and research entities. It is thanks to the work of the fora team that my foundation has entered into consultation with a variety of communities and groups. Consultations are held under the care of our four chairpersons, each of which is an expert in their respective area. The four tackle issues that include childhood, community life, disability, interfaith encounters, transcultural inclusion, and intergenerational dialogue. We engage with the different concerns of particular groups, while also learning what people think about the concept of well-being itself. In this way, we have realized that certain key themes emerge time and again. These are the role of stable relationships, the need for sustainable healthcare, the crucial importance of adequate income, and the priority that people give from all walks of life to the preservation and the conservation of the natural environment. It is through the Foundation's research entities that the consultations carried out within these fora are translated into scholarly research. A committed team of academics and practitioners transform the fora's popular and civic wisdom into a source of academic knowledge. It is this knowledge rooted in the lived experiences and aspirations of the people that motivates the Foundation's various research projects. These projects are then published and shared with academia, civil society, and government officials. In this way, the Foundation's research provides a powerful tool for the development of policy and strategic planning at both community and national level. In order for this information to be a valuable resource, we are mindful of our responsibility towards present and future generations. There appears to be a growing disparity between the ways older and younger generations live their lives, their perceived val values, and interactions with the world. It is therefore imperative that we include the voices of children and young people throughout our work. The Foundation continues to explore ways of securing the effective involvement of children and young people in consultation and decision-making. It is only by respecting this participation that our research policies and practices will accurately reflect the experiences of children and young people in society. This goal was a primary objective behind last year's first national conference on child well-being facilitated by my foundation. The conference included interventions by academics from the University of Malta, Dublin City University in Ireland, and Flinders' own Professor Philip Slee. The conference was unique in Malta for the way it prioritized the active participation of children by tackling issues of bullying from a child's perspective approach. Just as in the Foundation's Child Forum consultations, during this conference, it became clear that the focus on relationships, health, and adequate income are all key factors in the experience of well-being for children and young people. Furthermore, the conference set an example of good practice by mainstreaming 
child participation at a high level of engagement. Through this conference, it was confirmed that bullying can never be dismissed as harmless or as an unavoidable part of childhood and adolescence. As we all know, bullying has the power to disrupt lives. It damages the very fabric of our communities. Since coming to the presidency, I have embarked on a systematic program of visits to schools in Malta and Gozo. The aim of my visits is to create a child-friendly space for dialogue, where children are able to be frank during their conversations with me. One common issue that arises at nearly every meeting is the problem of bullying. Bullying is a predominant concern among our children and young people. Children speak of different forms of bullying, including physical harm, verbal abuse, and forced isolation. I have noticed during my visits that children who attend schools with a functioning anti-bullying policy seem to fare much better. They feel more able to reach out and speak up about their concerns. They are more resilient. They are better able to understand and access their rights. And they feel encouraged and empowered to, action on behalf, to take action on behalf of their peers. I would like to share some moments with you from this National Child Wellbeing Conference on Bullying, which highlights some of the information presented by, participant, by the participants. And there's a video coming.
ما هيك اطفال يراوني موران شهات بشيني يا دوارة تبزام البولي ها ها هو بيبي هو تفزاي توتش تنكوي تامو سي دوك ياك يا دوك تقبس اليوم الجايدنس اسا لوم موران تلجايدنس ولا يتوش تنكوتا بكاس نجميك ايام أشي بيرحم الله مارتينا ج جتايفني أشي في اللسان تاني أشي جت تيني ب ب من ما كرا أشي جدت ننتي على هومك وأنتي أشي شتاي على هومك أشي بصير تيني تف يتنتي على إيش أنا يفتر بولي ودي كات لونه كا هجر الجرات اللون لا ما في البريك اللون مش ممكن تصير بشني هو جت تجوارية أو أو شن جتايت مي ترجمة <تصفيق> بالمواصل ما تبدأ تفتح قلبك ومبعد نرى من المكشة ستون نعمله ما لا يستطع فعله لديمة سمع نشيء في البيتة نقلو يدخل هنا يدخلتها يسا يكون للعدول تيت يا مشاهدة لتفعل الدار الأطفال هم بطل جيلهم يزفوا قاوي فهم لسكوا على فوق أطفال إيها بولي بولي بقازي ويبولي دين فلس خفنا دراب يستايفون لي يوفو مبدلو في السكوا على يوما تاكن ويزا كن يبولي أو ليلو لو ما بكبرو دك المنتالتا لي بولينج بري سنس تسبتو تبولي أنت ما تتارا شوها تاكتا دايف منك فين تكون تدايف أغير So those were the skull groups of one of our villages called Sijiri at Verdala Palace, which is the um, summer residence of the president, but we use that place for educational activities. But the most significant results of that conference was that quite a number of uh, conferences, discussions, and, and also action had been taken since. That doesn't mean that bullying is not there anymore. We have to keep on working at it. Well, throughout the conference and in all the foundations, work with young people. We strive to promote child and adolescent well-being through participatory rights. We are committed to creating spaces where children can put forward their aspirations, where children can be made visible, and also to be acknowledged in their dignity. This October shall see the National Conference on Child Well-Being return to explore issues of access to justice for vulnerable children. Once again, children will participate in an integrated way along with an international panel of experts. It is thanks to our commitment to securing child participation that the Foundation has developed other opportunities for the empowerment of children. And these include an innovative pedagogy, which we call the President's Secret Garden. The President's Secret Garden was developed developed following consultations with children where they expressed a lack of access to green and open spaces. In response, we have built a child-centered community of learning active throughout Moulton Gozo. By prioritizing education for peace, for sustainable development, and above all, the participative inclusion of children, 
The secret garden is both a method and a means of promotion, promoting the social, emo uh, emotional, and environmental well-being of the child. The President's Secret Garden concluded its second edition last month and has led to the establishment of a Child and Young People's Council. This council will be a consultative body that will have a direct impact on the way the research and projects of the Foundation are carried out in the future. The Secret Garden itself offers a sustainable way of giving children access to their well-being, encouraging them to speak up for themselves, to foster confidence and resilience. The Secret Garden's methodology will soon be available as a toolkit and training program, accessible to both national and international stakeholders. It is this same concern for child well-being that motivated my foundation to promote the creation of a Commonwealth Child Forum at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting held in Malta last year. We remain committed to seeing such a forum come to fruition, providing a means to engage with children from all over the Commonwealth. Our other upcoming initiatives include an international roundtable on missing asylum-seeking children in Europe, which is scheduled to take place next year, and a high-level conference addressing the abolition of corporal punishment in 2018. At this conference, we shall share the message that violence inflicted on children, especially where it is excused or silenced by custom or convention, is never acceptable. It is our global responsibility to address the scourge of violence against children, wherever and whenever it appears in our communities and societies. This must include a strong focus on the problem of hate speech, of bullying, and of social exclusion. These continue to have harmful and long-term effects on our children and young people, especially those who are already vulnerable. If we are to achieve a positive change in the lives of young people, then we must encourage a culture where reflecting on issues of well-being begins at a young age. Awareness provides an essential component to strengthen our strategies of active citizenship. In this way, we will empower every child to consider and act upon the sources and hindrances of their own well-being within society. Alongside the mandate of our ethos, my foundation is guided in its work by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. To secure sustainable well-being for all, we must use, make use of the opportunity these goals provide. We must use the SDGs as an opportunity to take a critical and reflective look at society. In particular, we must challenge the underlying structures that perpetuate discrimination and inequalities to the direct detriment of well-being. My foundation remains steadfast in its efforts to confront the way these structures operate within society. We must challenge the way these structures silence certain voices and harm vulnerable communities. In response to these challenges, we have created and shall continue to create respectful and dignified spaces where every individual is celebrated and honored in the truth they share. In conclusion, we must be willing to enter into challenging conversations with one another because of our diversity. Diversity enriches us rather than diminishes us when we include others, even those with very, with very different perspectives. We must be open to the contributions of our children and young people, particularly when their interventions challenge our long-standing assumptions. We must continue to dedicate ourselves to the work of well-being. We must make the full participation of our children and young people central to our work. Only then can we achieve sustainable strategies for the fruitful transformation and the lasting benefit of our communities, our societies, and our nations. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It was a wonderful keynote, and I think it captured a great deal of the passion and commitment that is characteristic of your foundation. 
I think it also captures the synergy that exists between your foundation and the uh, Swap V Centre itself, and also the associated organisations that I've spoken this morning. One of the really important things I think that you touched upon in your keynote was that it connects so strongly with all of our work and all of us in this room. And so I think that kind of personal connection is such a significant one that you've managed to capture in, in the keynote this morning. So I thank you deeply.